part of the Press Play Podcast Network. And welcome to another Reg Iron Road, a podcast right here on the Press Play Podcast Network. As we get going, as we always do, we want to give a shout out to our producer, Ty Quartz, making sure we sound good when this reaches the podcatosphere and your phone, uh, your smart device, uh, your, your TV or wherever you're listening to us here on the Press Play Podcast Network. We appreciate that. We appreciate Ty and Please subscribe to the Press Play Podcast Network so you can get notifications whenever a new R&R podcast is dropped. Uh, And Michael Regai, speaking of drop, the Browns dropped their fifth in a row today uh, at home this time to the Cincinnati Bengals, 21-14. And that wasn't the only big story of the day. Deshaun Watson, the starting quarterback, goes down with what looks to be an Achilles tendon tear. They'll know more tomorrow as he gets uh, uh, the imaging done. But if you watched any of the video slow motion replay, you could literally see the the Achilles snap and shrivel up the back of his leg to his calf muscle, which is, uh, you know, uh, a bit... um, um, scary to look at, but uh, not a good day uh, for the Cleveland Browns. And then I'll throw in one more thing and get your thoughts on this. They spent $4 million on Jameis Winston to be the backup quarterback, and they decided today before the game that Dorian Thompson Robinson would be the backup quarterback should anything happen to Deshaun Watson, and it did. And Robinson came in and he stunk. So that's where we start the podcast today. Yeah, how about that? And you can. I'm smiling, chuckling because it uh, just so typical. Anytime you play three quarterbacks, can you know what usually is attached to that, right? Yep. A big L for loss, and uh, that that's exactly what happened once again today. And uh, I don't get the uh, uh, I don't get the Dorian Thompson Robinson thing, Ken. And if the kid turns out to be a real good NFL quarterback, of course, like always, I'll I'll say I was wrong. I don't see it, Kenny. I don't see it. I think the young man uh, would prefer to run the football himself than to, uh, you know, run an offense and uh, get the pass game where it needs to be. And I'm not pinning all the blame on him. I, I just... Uh, I put that right out there in front because you brought his name up, okay? I don't see him as a a winning, big-time NFL starting quarterback uh, anytime in the future. Just don't think that's what he is. Uh, so, um, you know, uh, to me, you uh, why don't you play Jameis Winston? Uh, I, I don't understand that. I mean, and, and no, nobody's saying Javis Winston is uh, going to be seen in uh, in Canton in the Hall of Fame here in Ohio when his career is uh, said and done and over with. But Kenny, if you try, there's no way in hell you could convince me that again. What are we looking at again? When you're going to go to have to go to a second quarterback, it who gives you at least an opportunity to win, right? Yep. As, give you. Dorian Thompson Robinson doesn't give the Browns an opportunity to win. Winston, you can at least be viable with your offense and your pass game and see what he's got that day. I mean, you know, again, like I say, not a Hall of Famer. Hell no. But he's been a starting quarterback in this league, and um, I, I, I don't get it. I don't think Dorian Thompson Robinson right now gives the Browns any chance to win. So that that's what I'm basing that on. So you looking to win football games? Um, Kevin Stefanski after the game today, Ken, he was very, uh, short and normally he's, you know, he, he's pretty, uh, extended and open and volume with how he answered. Not today, Ken. I don't know if you heard him. He was very short and kind of abrupt at times in answering questions. And so, uh, 
I don't know. Uh, what do you think? You think he's starting to feel uh, uh, oh. some of the uh, the pressure as how oh, yeah. this football team is uh, the record it has and the way it's underperforming? Uh, Reg, I I think the the pressure is getting to him now. Here's the one thing I will say in defense of Stefanski. If he is being forced or was being forced to play Deshaun Watson, I can't put all the blame on him. If he was forced to move the Dorian Thompson Robinson to the number two spot by owners or front office uh, members, I can't put all the blame on him. He's got a, a new contract extension, right? So he's going to get paid if he gets fired. But uh, I'm wondering, he says he's making these decisions. Well, mm. uh, I want to give Kevin Stefanski the, the benefit of the doubt on this, Michael. I think he knows some football, but if he truly indeed is making these decisions and not Andrew Barry and not Jimmy and Ms. D and JW and, and uh, the ownership group, if Kevin Stefanski is making the decision to play Deshaun Watson up to today before he got hurt because he gave him the best chance to win, to put Dorian Thompson Robinson in as the backup quarterback ahead of Jameis Winston, if he is making those decisions, he deserves to be fired because new, neither of those things were true. Deshaun Watson was horrible. I feel bad for him, and the fans were awful today when he went down with the Achilles injury, and they cheered him when he got hurt and everything. There's no place for that in sports, regardless of the sport, whether it's your team, the other team, you like a guy, you don't like the guy. There's no place for that, okay? None whatsoever. But there's no way you can tell me that Deshaun Watson, through his first 18 games coming into today, deserved to be on that field today. No way you can tell me that. And that's why I give Stefanski the benefit of the doubt. I think he was forced to play him. Same with DTR, because why? DTR was a draft pick, and Andrew Barry doesn't want to uh, uh, you know, look bad in getting rid uh, of a draft pick, especially a quarterback. And I'm with you. DTR ain't got no shot to make it in the NFL. None, Michael. There's a reason he played five years at UCLA. If you're any good, you come out after three. If you're no good, you stay for five or six or whatever it is. He's no good. That was a disaster today. 11 of 24, 82 yards, no touchdowns, two interceptions. In his career now, one touchdown pass, six interceptions for Dorian Thompson Robinson. Ain't no way you can tell me he's the better of the two quarterbacks between he and Jameis Winston. And oh yeah, Winston took you down, got you a touchdown pass and a two-point conversion, at least gave you a shot with the onside kick. Yeah, so let's assume uh, all that uh, that you brought out uh, is true. Now, to me, at some point, um, if, if, if he's being dictated to yep. that, he had to play Dorian Thompson Robinson. I'm go. I, I would have done it after the football game, but, uh, if he's not the first thing tomorrow morning, if Kevin Stefanski, again, to your point, if he is being told you got to play this kid, then I'm going to them and saying, then if that's the way you want to do this, you want me to play someone that gives us virtually no chance to win, then uh, I think I'm going to uh, have to call this a day right now then. Because I'm not – I'd look right at them, whether it's Barry Haslam, and say, I am not playing this young kid because he's not an NFL quarterback and he doesn't give us a chance to win. So if you want some lap dog to go out and do that, get somebody else. Cause I'm not playing. Amen. I'm with and you a hundred percent. million percent. Ken. Yep. I, I'm with you uh, totally on that. Mike. I know that's a lot of money to give up, right. To turn down, to walk away from, but uh, can you work like that? Can, no. can you, you be told? Hell no what no. to do, when to do it, how to do it day in and day out just to collect that paycheck. And I know it's a lot of money, Mike. I, I'd have a tough time doing that because I know that uh, if I walked away and there was a buyout or we, we reached some agreement, I'm going to get a job somewhere as an assistant and maybe as a head coach somewhere else because I won coach of the year twice and, and made the playoffs twice uh, doing it my way. Yeah, well, and again, I'll take it a step further. If that's the case, I am taking uh, Haslam's, Andrew Berry, 
Like you said, J double, whoever it is, I'm saying you come down into this damn locker room. I want you in this locker room and around my football team. And you tell them why you think that this young man should be our quarterback and how it gives us a real chance to win. I defy them to do that, Kenny, because it doesn't. And you know what? And again, if that costs me my job, I, I, I don't give a damn because you're telling me to play a kid. You want me to stand in front of my players in my room and try to convince them that this kid gives us a chance to win? All of them know better, Ken. Yep. I'm with you. You and I are on the same page. We we are on the same exact page, Michael. They're one and six. Okay, so the season's over. It's done, yeah. You stick a fork in them, they're done. So unless their idea is to tank and lose every game from here on out, which would be, what, five in a row and then 10 more, 15-game losing streak to close the season to guarantee the number one pick in the draft, that may, maybe that's the, the the mindset, that that because of all the wasted picks they gave away for Deshaun Watson, now they're going to have to eat the rest of this year's uh, part of his contract. He probably won't be ready to play next year, Michael, if it's a torn Achilles. That's right. Not at the beginning of the year. Or even maybe even all season long next year. So you could be. You've lost him for the rest of this year, it looks like, and maybe all of next year. So you're going to have to eat that contract. So maybe they just want to tank. They want to lose. I wouldn't be surprised if they traded Jameis Winston. I wouldn't be surprised if they traded Zadarius Smith, who said he wouldn't mind going to Detroit. I read somewhere uh, online, uh, you know, this week that. uh, uh, allegedly he made that quote uh, or gave that quote. So uh, you know what? Fine then. J- just come out and-, and let the players know who wants to stay, uh, who wants to be traded because we're going to try and lose mm-hmm. every game uh, to get the top draft pick. So if you want to be traded, let us know and we'll do our best. Yeah, well, and I mean, and, and Kenny, and you think of the way how glowing, just think about it, buddy. A couple of months ago, as we were, you know, previewing and projecting this Brown season Mm -hmm. and virtually every facet of it has turned into a cataclysmic disaster. Yep. All of it. And here you and I, and this would be, it could be a, a, a 9, 10, 11 win football team in the playoffs. And look how quickly things can just completely get ripped apart at its very core and go bad. Well, here's your, if you don't think that can be the case, here's your prime example with this football team. And, you know, like I said, we've given a lot of kudos to Andrew Barry and Kevin Stefanski. You and I both have. Yep. Over the course of the last couple of years, well, neither one of them are living up to it, in my opinion. Neither one of them. I, I don't like the job that either one of them uh, ha- have done over the course of this season leading up to the year and going into the year. And um, again, you brought out a point earlier on. We don't know if Stefanski is being, um, you know, at just basically handcuffed to play certain guys. But if that's the case, here's one thing Kevin Stefanski can do. As I said, I wouldn't stand for that crap. You making me, then I'm gone. The, the, the hell with it. I'm out of, yeah, I know, giving up a lot of money. But I'm gone because you are forcing me to play guys that I know can't win in this league consistently. Kenny, how do you stand in front of your players and try to sell that if you're him? I'd I'd have a tough time doing it, Michael. I'd have a hell of a time doing it. And they're going to be able to to see it in your face, hear it in your tone. Of course they are. Right? So those players, Kenny, those players know. They're not like an NFL locker room. They know that they that I guarantee you, you gave them all true serum. They'd all smile at you and say, we can't win with Dorian Thompson Robinson quarterback in this football team. This kid's not ready for this. He's not yep. an NFL quarterback. Yep. I heard that today when I was driving to my, uh, Oh, my get together with the Stark County Browns backers on the Browns mm-hmm. radio network that he was elevated to the number two quarterback. Yeah. Right. And not for, you know, uh, not because Winston was hurt or sick or anything. Winston was going to be the emergency quarterback. So he dressed and he ended up playing because Robinson hurt his finger. So maybe that'll save him. Maybe they're going to have to play uh, Jameis Winston if DTR is hurt as well as 
uh, you know, Deshaun Watson going down. So, my hey, Michael, real quick, um, five in a row they've lost their one and six. They've yet yep. to score 20 points in a game. They gave up a 100 yard kickoff. Hey, we finally saw that? the dynamic kickoff return today. Oh, yeah, didn't we? Came yeah, from yeah the for the opposition. Bengals, that was dynamic. <laughs> yeah, opposition did it. And to start the football game off. 100-yard kickoff return to start it. Um, DTR throws two picks when he comes in. So th- this is just a, a complete disaster, dumpster fire. The road, it's dog crap, <laughs> as Sindelar <laughs> used to say to us, uh, Michael, on the radio. Oh, yeah. And he'd say something else off the radio when things were bad. Uh, yeah. And he's right. This team uh, is the worst in the NFL with the New England Patriots. They're one and six, just like the Patriots. That is the worst record right now in the entire National Football League. I don't think they're going to win five games, four games, maybe. And and who knows? Who knows? I mean, uh, until we see it, how do we? They may not win again with this type of play and these type of decisions that are being made. Um, I mean, so it's uh, it's really kind of disgusting and leaves an awful taste the way that this this football season and there's still 10 games to go oh my goodness to play and have to deal with all this road man the only bright spot today michael red guy your guy came back and he delivered right Nick Chubb, after being injured in week two last year at Pittsburgh that gruesome knee injury Came all the way back, rehabbed his way back into the starting lineup today and scored one of the two touchdowns for the Browns today. It was good to see number 24 back out there for the Browns, even though the offensive line didn't do him any favors with any holes yeah. to run through except on that touchdown. Well, Chubb's pro's pro, and we know he's one of the uh, the best running backs in the National Football League. So just thrilled to see him back. And, of course, in typical fashion, kind of – just made me uh, made me feel even better. Why I loved him more is because after the football game, Kenny's like, "We lost, you know. Right. Yep. We look, we lost." I want to talk about uh, me having a two yard touchdown run. We it wasn't enough because we lost the football game, and that's the most important thing. Now, there's probably the biggest reason why I love Nick Chubb. And, um, you know, uh, uh, obviously we, uh, we sincerely hope that uh, he is able to continue to, um, get back to the type of play week by week that, but, but there's another thing, Ken, with this thing sitting at one and six, I mean, I, I don't know how much, how many carries, how much do you want to trot them out there now? I know Great the question. man wants to play and Great I question. get that, yeah. but, but I mean, uh, I, I got to believe he's going to continue to stay on the pitch count. I would think so for the next couple of weeks leading into the bye week, right, Reg? Yes. You know, after, up until the bye week and then smart, after that. they better. Yeah, yeah. And, and so, hey, if Jameis Winston's the quarterback, veteran quarterback with mm-hmm. Nick Chubb, okay, man, that might uh, mm-hmm. help the offense because right now the offense is one of the worst in the league. Like we said, they have not scored 20 points in a game yet this season. They scored 14 today, and the last one you could say was a garbage touchdown, but, hey, they they scored it and got the two-point conversion. Uh, you know, so from that perspective, yep. uh, that, that was great. But uh, Chubb and Winston, and we haven't even touched on the Amari Cooper trade, Michael. And what does Amari Cooper do today? He goes and catches touchdown, four passes, catch. yeah. 66 yards and a touchdown for the Buffalo Bills today. Uh, mm-hmm. And, oh, yeah, Kareem Hunt, who wasn't good enough to be on this team to start the season, that's added right. two more touchdowns for the Kansas City Chiefs today. So, again, that's on the, the the front office and their stupidity with the moves they made in the offseason, the players they kept they didn't keep, and it's coming back to bite them in the ass right now. You know else is having a bad year? A guy we've given nothing but flowers, bouquets, and love to. Andrew Barry's having a real Whoa, bad man. year. Yeah, and it started in the spring. Real bad year, Andrew Barry. I'm with you 100% again, my You and I, and we didn't talk or prepare this uh, podcast. We never do. We just let it fly, keep it real, bring it strong here on the r r podcast. So, yeah, Andrew Barry, uh, I think his seat's hotter than Kevin Stefanski's might because be. he gave, yeah, he's he giving right. the roster to Kevin Stefanski to coach. And then maybe he or Jimmy or both are forcing Stefanski to play that roster. Well, that roster stinks. 
that roster's terrible. Uh, and uh, that's why I said I, I could see multiple trades coming in the not too distant future uh, as teams need a pass rusher, they need um, a, a quarterback. Uh, maybe they need a, a veteran offensive lineman, get rid of Jack Conklin or Jed Wills or somebody like that. So I could see multiple moves being made uh, in the not too distant future. You're on point with that road, man. And I got a feeling as you have alluded to, yes, there's going to be a lot of these fellas that currently wear orange and brown. They're going to be taking that trip up to Andrew Barry's office or having the, their agents say, get me out of here. Yep. Get me out of here. Watch. It's going to happen. I don't like it if a player doesn't give his all for a team, Michael, and some people thought that's what Amari Cooper did, but you could understand why Amari Cooper might have done that considering how they treated him in the offseason, right? Didn't extend him. Uh, the trade rumors involving him. Then they give him, uh, you know, what supposedly is a, a a contract boost right before the season starts. And then he goes out there and he he's not, you know, focused 100%. I hate when that happens, but I can understand why that might happen uh, to somebody like that. And the Buffalo Bills have benefited uh, from him maybe working his way out of Cleveland uh, to Buffalo. And uh, he's going to help that. Hey, Buffalo, right now, Buffalo, Baltimore, Kansas City in the AFC. In the NFC, it's the Detroit Lions, in my opinion, and everybody else. Uh, yeah, I mean, the Aiden Hutchinson, you know, injury uh, hurt. Even saw it today, even though they, uh, you know, they uh, they got a big win and they came back and won. Um, but, yeah, I, you know, you, you, I'm with you. You'd have to consider them the favorites right now in the NFC. Yes, yeah. I think they're going to go out and get another defensive lineman, and maybe it is Darius Smith or somebody else maybe. Uh, to uh, fill the void of Hutchinson, who said, you know, if they get to the Super Bowl, he might be able to come back. It's kind of like Rod Woodson, if you remember, when he blew I out do. his knee in yep. game one for the Steelers against uh, the Lions and Barry Sanders and was able yes. to come back and play against Dallas in that Super Bowl. So, uh, but uh, I don't know. Uh, it's that, risky. A, I mean, yeah, yeah, but you know, that's that that's hanging on to hope that uh, uh something that is a uh a 50-50 at best. Right. So yes, I would uh and I would imagine that some of these Browns, like you mentioned, some of those uh the the well the uh, the couple of veteran defensive linemen in particular, yep. uh like I said, them and their agents, don't be surprised. Don't be surprised if they start uh telling Andrew Barry, get me out of here. Get me out of here. Get me to a place that's got a chance to win. And, oh, yeah, by the way, next week you host the Baltimore Ravens. <laughs> Good luck with that. That's an L. That's yeah. another one. But they uh, but, all are. Yeah. You know, they all are. Uh, you know, uh, St. Ed's might be able to take down the, uh, the <laughs> Cleveland Browns right now. Uh, so one in six, five in a row. Watson could be lost for the season. Uh, and, Michael, real quick on the fans. I, I know he wasn't a crowd favorite, and I wanted him benched, but not via injury, Michael. I, I hate seeing that no matter who the player is, right? So that that was, and I know the players were upset about that uh, after be. the game, and, and I be. get it. I, I totally get why, you know, they were pissed off, and, uh, you know, they, they voiced their displeasure uh, and all of that, and, and they had the right to do that. The fans got to be better than that. You're damn right they have to, and, uh, you know, uh, if you did that, um, I don't want you in my family because that is, uh, to me, that's despicable and that's uh, horrendous, and it has just no place, no place in a, uh, a field of athletic competition and endeavor. I don't, I don't give a damn who, you, you, you do not even think about putting out there that you want to cheer for somebody who's uh, being carted off with it, and it's very apparent that that's a serious injury, Ken. Yep. Right? And yep. you go, you're going to start cheering that, huh? Well, uh, you're not my kind of person. How about I just put a period on it right there? Not my kind of person, and I don't want nothing to do with you. If that's how you conduct yourself and feel like you have a right to do at sporting events because you pay money, now nah, to hell with you. Don't want nothing to do with you. 
All right, Reg, uh, let's put a period on the Browns completely here, all right? Uh, and we'll get a break in here on the r r podcast. When we come back, we've got to talk about the Guardians as their season unfortunately came to a close, but much later than most of us thought it would. We'll break down the entire season and what the future looks like for the Cleveland Guardians when we return to the Reg and Rota podcast here on the Press Play Podcast Network. What's up, everyone? I'm Holly Wetzel. And I'm Tyrus Powell. And we are your hosts of The Orange is Oranger, a Cleveland Browns podcast on the Press Play Podcast Network. We give you all the dog pound coverage that you'll need to get you through the regular season, hopeful postseason, and I'd say off-season, Tyvis, but is there really ever an off-season for this team? Thankfully for our podcast, Holly, there really never is when it comes to the Cleveland Browns. Don't miss our breakdown of each week's matchup game recaps and any and all news out of Berea to feed your Browns appetite. As we know, Holly, dogs gotta eat. Yes, they do. So hit that subscribe button and never miss an episode of the Orange is Orange Cleveland Browns podcast on the Press Play Podcast Network. Hey everybody, it's Sam Amico from Cavs on the Break NBA podcast. Be sure to give us a listen for all your Cleveland Cavaliers recaps, analysis, breakdowns, draft talk, free agency. The list goes on and on. Give us a listen. Cavs on the break NBA podcast. Looking for new insights on the Cleveland sports scene with a unique side of Cleveland sports history. Then you found the perfect podcast. I'm John Sable. And I'm Scott Sable, and we're hosts of the Sable Brothers on the Baseline podcast, a podcast about Cleveland sports, but not your typical podcast about the land's sports teams. Join us as we embark on a journey of sharing a unique and historical side of Cleveland sports history with the help of some former Cleveland sports stars and other historical figures. All right here on the Sable Brothers on the Baseline podcast, part of the Press Play Podcast Network. And we return to the Reg Eye and Rota podcast here on the Press Play Podcast Network. Michael, the Cleveland Guardians season. Boy, what a season it was from the solar eclipse on the home opener to game five of the ALCS. A great ride for a young team that a lot of us didn't think would even make the playoffs, let alone get to the ALCS. Uh, it comes to an end, though, in game five of that American League Championship Series in extra innings losing to the better team and the higher payroll again, the New York Yankees 5-2 to two in game number five, and the Yankees win it 4-1, move on to the World Series for the first time since 2009, and the Guardians' drought unfortunately continues, goes all the way back to 1948. But, Michael, a lot to be uh, excited about and uh, pleased about based on what we saw from the Guardians this season. Well, sure. You never feel good about the season coming to end in uh, mid-October when you, you're right there. Possibly you win another series and you're on the cusp of uh, playing for a, uh, a world's championship in, in Major League Baseball. But that having been said, yeah, this is a baseball team that uh, certainly gave this fan base and uh, everyone that follows them a, a lot of uh, tremendous moments, a lot of great feeling. And you're right, a lot to feel good about. Um, I hope Stephen Vogt, uh, who, you know, had a very, he's with them and having that very strong year. Yep. I'm not trying to take away from that, but he made a couple decisions over the weekend, Kenny, that, uh, and I'm, I'm, I was there, I was at the game, and I, when it happened, no, man, no, no, what are you doing? Don't pitch to John Carlos Stanton here, Reg. But he did one, twice. Yep, and, I, 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 and those balls are still orbiting the <laughs> Earth that Stanton uh, just d- destroyed. Michael, I wanted to start positive uh, and give them, you know, uh, kudos and the love for a season none of us expected, which they did. Right? I was there for the solar eclipse. Uh, and that was a, an unbelievable day. Uh, I, I made uh, what game we, the game they won in the playoff uh, ALCS. I was there for that game. I missed others because of commitments with WHBC Radio, high school football, and everything. I wasn't there for the the final game, but it was a fun team to cover. But now that we said, "Hey, great job, good season, a lot to build on," if we just want to break down what happened in the ALCS. 
I'll go back to game one, bringing Joey Cantillo in uh, yeah, with the, yeah. the bases loaded uh, in game one at New York. There when earlier go. in the year in the Bronx, he gave up six or seven runs. You don't bring a rookie in. That's where Pedro Avila should have been brought in. And then, like you said, throughout the series, uh, Booney would not let Jose beat him, even though Jose was sing- uh, swinging a cold stick. And for whatever reason, Stephen Vogt, rookie mistakes, decided, you know what? La mano y mano, that macho bullshit. I hate it when it happens. And, and Michael, <laughs> that's yeah. exactly what that was. I don't care that Tanner Bybee struck him out twice in game five before that at bat. Guess what that means? That means he's seen you twice now. He's got your timing down. And if you make a mistake, he's going to hit the crap out of it. And that's exactly what he did. But I don't blame Bybee for that. I blame Vote for yeah. not walking him and make Jazz Chisholm bat next. You have to. You have to. You just one million percent have to. And uh, I tell you, I think there were a lot of people that feel the same way because, again, I, I was there, and, and boy, we had some big conversations going on, and um, it was just – I Kenny, I, I just could not come to a way – to fathom why Stephen Vogt decided that that was the right move to make with first base open, oh. and you're going to let Giancarlo Stanton, who, by the way, Kenny, if you just for everybody who wants numbers, he now has, um, I believe he's got the most postseason home runs of, uh, of any player in Major League Baseball history. Um, I, don't, and- I don't know if it's in, in – I think he has the most – for the Yankees through so many games, Reg. Uh, Manny Ramirez is still number one okay. uh, in postseason history with Jose Altuve number two. So the list that I saw was based on, uh, they compared him to the Bambino and some it of the other true. Yankees. It, oh, the Yankees. Yes, and the Yankees. that's what it was. Okay. Yeah. 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 So yeah. Uh, all right. Uh, I'm still going to, uh, every moment I can breathe, <laughs> tell you it's a terrible move by Stephen Vogt. And um, that's not, again, believe me, that's not second guessing after the fact. Right. Because I was just incredulous that you were going to pitch to Stanton there in that situation. So, uh, you know, hopefully Stephen Vogt, uh, he's got a, uh, you know, he's got four or five months now before spring training to reflect on all of that. And hopefully he learns from that because, I, you know, I know you said, well, he, he punched out, Stanton punched out. But look, I mean, you know, you've got to uh, maybe all the more reason you <laughs> you don't go back and look to get the same result yet again. Yep. But uh, uh, you can say what you want about uh, Stanton. Yeah, he strikes out a lot. And yeah, I know he's, uh, you know, he is uh, not an average hitter anymore. But man, again, uh he still delivers big time in October, uh, and now it's for the Yankees. And um, I just, I, 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 I just couldn't fathom that vote wanted to pitch to him in that situation. Michael, he had four hits in the series, uh, and all home runs. They were all home Every runs, one of them, right? Yeah. And three games in a row. So he had a a two game homer streak coming into Game Five. You had struck him out a couple of times, yes, but again, Tanner Bybee. I know you wanted to get length. Walk him, let him pitch to Jazz Chisholm, and take your chance. If Jazz Chisholm hits a three-run homer off of Tanner Bybee, I don't question vote. I don't question Bybee. I just tip my cap to Jazz Chisholm, who was batting a buck 67 versus Stanton, who's hitting 294 for the entire playoffs with five home runs now and 11 RBIs. It was a stupid, no other way to say it, a stupid, stupid, stupid... Just a bad, stupid decision by Stephen Vogt, and I don't care how he tries to explain it otherwise. Yeah. Well, that's that's 100%, and so we don't have to continue to because yeah. I think if uh, you understand the game and know the game, again, first, just the, you don't know, let John Carlos stand and beat you with a long ball. You just don't. And you would take your chance with, I don't have Jazz Chisholm or Anthony Rizzo or anybody else they had hitting behind Stanton. That's the guy I want to face. I am not. Lutton Stanton beat us with a bomb. Both End of story. Twi- Kenny, yep. he did it twice. Yep. Twice. Yep. Yeah. I don't. Over I the don't. weekend. And I will I, say I, this, though. Michael, 
Whatever amount of money Juan Soto wants, I oh would my, give yeah. him mm-hmm. as an owner. I think he might be the most complete player in Major League Baseball when you factor in not just the regular season, right? And that he plays yeah. an actual position. He's not just a DH, but the postseason. He loves the spotlight. He's in that batter's box dancing. He's chirping. He's looking at the pitcher, and he's saying, I I got you, Gaddis. I got you, Gaddis. You ain't got nothing on me. I timed that up. I timed that up. And sure enough, man, uh, he crushed one and um, won me a parlay. So thank you, Juan Soto, uh, for that that home run uh, late in the game there. Uh, love that, but I would give him $650, $700 million. That ain't my money. So I, I pay him whatever he wants because I know come October and maybe November that he's going to deliver in a big, big way. And uh, how about this, Michael Red Guy? The three stars for the New York Yankees in the postseason Juan Soto batting 333, three homers, eight RBIs. Uh, John Carlos Stanton, 294, five homers, 11 RBIs. Judge, average stinks, 161, but two homers, six RBIs. So two out of their three stars shined when Ramirez and Classe and Bone, excuse me, Josh Naylor stunk the joint up for the Cleveland Guardians. Well, you're right. And and look, again, say what you want, but that's why guys like that have that that NY on uh, their jersey front because – Look, that's what's – you got wear that NY. You better damn deliver in October. I mean, how long has it been since they've won it all now? 2009. It, it, so that, you know, 13 years now, taking all kinds of heat, and and they got guys that know, well, if I don't deliver in right. October, then I, I'm, I'm, I'm going to get my, my butt run out of here on a rail. It's that simple. Yeah. Um, because they're not going to continue to stand for that. But you're right. They're big, big players, the ones that had to did. And, um, you know, real nice year, real nice year, Guardians. Excellent year. Um, I applaud you for that, for the full season. But, um, you know, again, in my opinion, the manager, manager let the team down uh, with some of his uh, awkward, I'll, I'll use the term awkward decisions that he made, um, you know, against guys like that, like like a, a John Carlos Stanton, who's proven that he has shined in October with hitting a long ball. So um, again, I think Stephen Vogt's got a lot to think about, but uh, to me, um, excellent year again, doesn't take yep. but he, but he let his team down a little bit with some of those awkward decisions he made. Um, uh, Michael Jose Ramirez hit 200 for the postseason, 10 games batted 200. He continues to struggle when the uh spotlights are the brightest, the games are the biggest. He is not a, a clutch player in the postseason. I ever we love Jose, took a hometown discount. A uh, heck of a player is going to be in the top five of so many categories for the Cleveland Guardians when it's all said and done. Mm-hmm. But um, I, everybody's crowning him a Hall of Fame already. I'm sorry. I, I'm not ready. To me, he's nowhere near Albert Bell. He's nowhere near Manny Ramirez. He's nowhere near uh, Jim Tomey because those guys did it in the postseason, uh, whereas uh, Jose has failed miserably yep. in the postseason. And if he wants to really be mentioned with those guys and in the Hall of Fame conversation, He's got to do it come October, and uh, he he has been unable to do that. Michael, he has now played in 42 postseason games and has four home runs and is batting for his career in the postseason 233. That's got to get better if you're the focal point of the team, and he is. Well, absolutely. It's got to get better, and uh, you laid it out very nicely, buddy. And um, again, um, you know, you can, uh, to me, if I said this, I'll probably have a lot of uh, Guardians fans upset at me. To me, Kenny Rhoda, Jose Ramirez is in the hall of very good. And yeah, there's nothing wrong with that. Nope. There's nothing wrong with that. Yeah, everybody, baseball team needs very good players. And would I take Jose Ramirez on my team? Yeah, damn right I, sure, I, I would. Sure, sure. But... He's in the hall of very good. Right. Um, you, you know, look, again, look at uh, Juan Soto, 
Giancarlo Stanton, right? Yep. Even though Aaron Judge, he still hit, uh, when he hit two bombs in the series? Yeah. Drove in seven runs. Um, he not even swinging the bat real well. So, you know, until Jose does that, Ken, he's a very good player. Everybody here loves him. Yeah, he took the hometown discount and whatever, but he's got to do more production-wise in October, Ken. It's that simple. He does. Michael, and I don't want to go too too much more on this and on a tangent on Jose because he he's part of the reason they got there, right? Yes. Uh, almost went 40-40-40. Uh, over a hundred RBIs, uh, stolen bases are great. Stole one base in the postseason, by the way. Uh, yeah. you know, the home runs double and all that. Uh, but, uh, for me, as you put it, he's an all-star. They call him a superstar. I guess on this team, he's considered a superstar, but compared to other players in the league, I know he's finished top three, top five, but he hadn't won it yet. Right. MVP, Right. So right. that that yep. needs to change in the postseason for him to elevate for me. And Josh Naylor's got to be better too. He hit 225 this postseason, zero home runs after 30 mm-hmm. plus in the regular season, and only five RBIs. Um, and uh, if he is really serious about the game, Michael, no, I know where you're going. Dude's yes. got to drop 15 to 20 pounds, man. I mean, mm-hmm. come on, he he does. He looks like Babe mm-hmm. Ruth out there, uh, and, and that was from uh, you know way back in the day when when the Babe was uh, big. But Babe was hitting sixty homers a year and winning championships. <laughs> That's right. Josh yeah. Naylor, two twenty five, zero home runs, five RBIs in the postseason. Uh, t- take the off season training uh, a little bit more seriously, Josh. If you mm-hmm. want to get paid, okay, and I think he's uh, final year arbitration eligible this year. You want to get paid big time bucks. Then you got to take better care of yourself. And Michael, explain to me the Emmanuel Classe, or as my buddies Mm -hmm. were calling him, Jose Classe, and and how he goes from the most dominant closer in the game in the regular season to 0 and 2 with a 9.00 ERA this postseason. Uh, Other than to say, um, there in lies. The big difference, as we just discussed, Ken, Yeah. what happens from April 1st up to October 1st and that 162-game marathon that is a baseball regular season, and then who brings it ultimate strong and gets it done in October? There's a huge difference there, isn't there? Oh, my right? goodness. We've seen that for as long as we've been watching baseball. And um, again, um, <laughs> has Pe- as Pedro Martinez uh, remember him after oh. getting beat? The Yankees are my daddy. Yeah. But, well, you know, Emmanuel Classe looks to me like the Yankees are your daddy. Well said, and so true. I I just was. Blown away by what happened in the Tiger series. That's where it started, right? Yes. And yes. then it carried over into the Yankees series. And I want to give the Yankees some credit here, Michael. I don't know if you heard this or not, but Aaron Judge and John Carlos Stanton took extra batting practice um, yep. so they could be prepared for Emmanuel Classe. That's that that was specifically to get ready for Classe and the heat that he throws, the cutter that he throws moving the the pitching machines a little bit to the right, a little bit to the left to simulate him. And then when the pitch was on the outside corner, they were hitting the ball to right. Imagine that. They actually were hitting the ball where it was pitched, Mike Regai, instead Mm -hmm. of trying to pull every god darn thing and and, uh, hit it over the scoreboard in left field. Well, that goes to show you how, uh, you know, uh, there's an expectation there, as we said. Now, you know, look, uh, these guys at least give them credit for being uh, intelligent enough to know there's hell to be paid. You put on that NY and you don't perform in October when you're one of the the big guns? Kenny, you know what that means, man. You are uh, persona non grata in that city and um, from that fan base. So these guys are taking it very, very seriously. You know, I'm not uh, a position player. Juan Soto's the best in baseball. Yeah. 
I'm, I'm with you. He's best only, in baseball. He's yeah. only 25 years old. 25 won, years old. Yeah. Won a championship at 19, and he was dancing and chirping uh, against Verlander back then. He didn't care yeah. who was on the mound. No. You got to beat me. I'm not afraid of you. You should be afraid of me. That's his mindset. And I mm-hmm. wish more players would have that mindset in October. It seems they cower and, and they crumble under the pressure of that as opposed to, uh, I heard uh, C.J. Uh, Stroud say this, pressure is a privilege, man. Not everybody gets to be in these situations. Young fella's right. He's you, right. You, it is a privilege. Yeah. A privilege you you should then... adore it. You That's should right. be happy you're in that situation. That's why you play the game. At any sport. And then you judge yourself off that. And if you, that that pressure, yes, it gets ramped up. In every postseason, in every team sport going. Yes, the pressure gets ramped up. Why? Because, well, number one, you're playing other teams, right, that are either uh, very close to your equal, if not better than you. Right. Now how are you going to perform against the uh, the the A competition uh, throughout a playoff series in a team sport? So, I mean, look, look, there's all – and and anybody that, uh, that takes that uh, any less than a million per – Sent seriously, Ken. You're in a team sport and you're playing the part. Man, you 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 got to be ready to really ramp it up and grind at every moment. If you don't, well, then you know you're and you're going to see situations that uh, cause you to lose. I mean, period. And we saw yep. that over this past weekend uh, down at the ballpark here in downtown Cleveland. Hey, let's give some love to Stephen Kwani at 381 in the playoffs. Brian Rocchio, 333, although two of his ear errors were very, very costly. Yes. Uh, simple plays that he didn't make the lead to runs for the Yankees, but he hit the ball well. Manzardo, not bad, hit 316. David Fry with that huge homer. What a night that was. A big Christmas ties it up. David Fry wins the one game in the ALCS. Uh, but after that, nobody really did much. Uh, and so, Michael, uh, some bright things to look forward to next year. Um, do you have any hope that the Dolans, with hitting 2 million in attendance this year, with having one, two, three, four, five, six postseason gate receipts this year, do you have any hope that the Dolans might spend a few bucks this offseason and address that outfield position uh, that uh, I think they need as far as a power hitter or a starting pitcher? Because while the bullpen was good for most of the playoffs, it got wore down because they had no starting pitching that they could rely on uh, in the Yankee series. Well, again, you hit it exactly what's needed. Uh, Do I have a lot of uh, good feeling that that's what's going to be delivered by the ownership? I wish I could say yes, Ken, but, but I really, really don't. Yeah, especially because they said, "Look, well, I mean, look if they they get to the postseason with this type of payroll." So if you're sitting in their seats, right? Don't you feel like we'll just continue to do this? We'll get to the postseason, and um, you know, one of them will come our way and uh, get to the World Series and maybe win a championship. But I, I no, I don't have a lot of uh, a lot of faith that they're going to drastically look to increase the payroll. No, Michael, don't you think though? At some point, they have to realize that it only gets them so far. That if they truly want to deliver a World Series to the city of Cleveland and their loyal fans, right? That mm-hmm. they would spend a little bit more money. Here's what pisses me off about this. All right. They talk about, well, we can't afford to, uh, you know, well, what happened with Bally's and everything, we're a small market and all that crap. You paid, what, how much did they pay for the team? Well, what, do you remember what it was, uh, uh, what, they, what they bought? Three, was it $350 million? I Something was going like to say, yeah, wasn't it between three fifty and $400 million? Okay, let's, just, let's just guessing. round up the four hundred. Well, they're worth $1.5 billion. So, you know what? You'll make that money back when you sell the team. Mm -hmm. So, you know what? Uh, Go in now, uh, since you have some talent and made it to the ALCS, and spend a few bucks on on the things that you need uh, with a power-hitting outfielder, a legit starting pitcher, uh, and, uh, you know, maybe you can get a catcher that can hit 200. You know, that sure as hell would be nice (laughs) if you could find a catcher that could hit 200 on a regular basis. 
That that's very very true. Uh, again, I uh, I surely hope they look at it that way, Kenny, and and say yes, uh, we're going to spend this type of money. But I, I just don't have anything affirmative that I can say. Well, yeah, they'll do that because here, right? Yeah, they should, right? They should. You just laid out why, but uh, unfortunately, uh, I do not see that happening. No. Yeah, me neither, unfortunately. So, um, but having said all that, we don't want it to be all negative. Rhoda, you're only negative. You only ask negative questions and talk well, negative. That's not, no, that's not true. But you know, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, Go ahead. So, th- th- uh, a season I didn't expect, a fun season. Let's hope they build on it and they don't just stay status quo like the Cavaliers did this offseason. Yes, they signed their own, but they didn't add to it. And maybe next week we'll get into the Cavaliers after their season gets underway uh, for the uh, uh, 2024-25 year. Sure. Uh, yeah. I will say this. We know Max Struess out for at least six weeks with an ankle sprain. Right. So yeah. he will not be in the lineup for the Cavaliers when they open up on Wednesday uh, at Toronto and then Friday at home against Detroit. Uh, so that means either Karis LeVert or Isaac Okoro or one of those guys will be in the starting lineup mm-hmm. for Max Struess. Yeah, it's going to have to be. I would think they're going to, you know, uh, go with the Coro so you can keep Levert in that six-man role that he was very, very good at last year. But, well, you know, I mean, we'll see. But, but uh, Kenny, um, a name we haven't mentioned, uh, Chris Antonetti. Okay? Okay. There. All right. I, they, listen, I have abundantly more faith and confidence in Chris Antonetti in terms of his – roster structuring and okay. what he can then I now do Andrew Barry because I don't even think there's a uh, even a minute comparison any longer um, and again you know you and and Antonetti's doing it as we just said without the luxury of knowing he's got an unlimited payroll right I mean you know so one thing yeah, Haslam's uh, they'll throw money all around won't they Hey, they will. throw money yeah. all over the place. Not in the right places many times, but they're going to throw all kinds of money around, and and they uh, are very confident in what Andrew Barry – well, Andrew Barry failed at his roster composition going into this season. He failed. Yes, and again, he did. I am all kind of, – who gave Andrew Barry on a more kudos than me? Nobody. And yet, but now it, it, it has – now it's turned a 180. And I don't, he didn't do much constructive this offseason to make this football team better. Chris Antonetti has vastly outperformed in that role, Andrew Barry, to me. So that, that's a big plus and positive for um, the Guardians going into this offseason and into next year. I think Antonetti, uh, and, and look, he knows what he's up against, Ken. We just laid it out there, right? Yeah. He's got to do it without deep pockets. Yes. And that's no longer easy when you are trying to put a pro franchise together as their uh, VP of uh, of operations and general manager. It's not easy, but, but uh, Antonetti's done a hell of a good job with it. The reason we we maybe are a little hard on the Guardians is they get close so many times and yet still come up short, and that's why I'm hoping the Dolans will spend a few more dollars or uh, Blitzer, the uh, the the co-owner, will yeah. uh, step in and maybe want to fork it over or with the money they made this year and in, in attendance, they'll fork it over. But it was a fun season, exciting times, and uh, at really least was. something, hey, really something was. positive to build on, something to look forward to next year. Can't say the same about the Browns, and we'll see what the Cavs give us here as they start up on uh, this week. Yes, right? absolutely, Ken. Good stuff, man. Always, uh, always enjoy it, and we'll keep doing it. We'll have another r r podcast for you uh, in the not-too-distant future. You can always check things out at the Press Play Podcast Network. And if you subscribe there, uh, you'll be notified whenever uh, Reg Eye and Rhoda drop something for you to listen to uh, about your favorite teams in town. Thanks to Ty Quartz, as always, our producer, uh, for doing what he does so you all can hear that. Most of all, thanks to you for your loyalty and your listenership. Uh, Michael and I uh, appreciate that more than you know.